Hi, um, I'm uh, Madhava Prasad. I'll be chairing this session. And uh, well, you know, the, it's, a, it's a very interesting sort of uh, paper that uh, Javed Maji is uh, presenting and um, uh, speaks to, in some, at least, you know, in a, in a, indirectly to the question of the linguist's body, which is, of course, the question for all of us, like the incarcerated body of uh, Hani Babu. Uh, he might be still practicing his the linguistic craft inside there, but we want uh, his uh, body to be free to do, uh, you know, as uh, whatever, you know, wherever, who, wherever he wishes. Um, so this this uh, interesting paper is being presented by the linguist's body, Grierson's uh, eyesight and the ocular ocular in the LSI, the Linguistic Survey of India, 1903-1928, uh, is being presented by Professor Javed Majid of uh, King's College London. Um, uh, one minute, please. Uh, His, uh, it's a paper which uh, uh, takes up the unpublished correspondence of uh, Grierson and uh, talks about the problems uh, he was facing with his eyesight during his, uh, uh, during his work on the linguistic survey. I uh, invite Professor Javed Majid to present his paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can you hear me fine? Yes, yes. You yeah, can. and you can see the slides on yes. my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. So thanks very much, uh, Aisha, for the invitation. I mean, it's really an honor and privilege to speak at this uh, moving event in support of Hani Babu, whose work inspires so much of us, so many of us, and also um, an honor to follow on from uh, so many good papers over the last uh, two days and today, um, which actually are quite hard acts to follow. <laughs> so um, as many of you know, Hani Babu tested positive for COVID-19 and he got a very serious eye infection that assumed uh, dangerous proportions. Um, thankfully, his eye has been saved, but it's this predicament uh, which prompts my talk today. And what I want to really talk about is to draw on Grierson's unpublished correspondence to look at the question of his struggles with his eyesight, um, the question of embodiment, and the dynamics of looking in the linguistic survey of India. And then I'll end by with some thoughts on Darian Leader's ste Stealing the Mona Lisa, What Art Stops Us From Seeing which is a very interesting book on the dynamics of looking and eyesight. And um, also with Fez's prison poetry and the question of the dynamics of looking um, in jail um, so that uh, while under state surveillance uh, in jail, Fez uh, created a kind of another way of seeing to resist and defy the state's gaze. So those are, that's basically what I'm going to cover. So, um, so how does Grayson's body appear in the survey? Um, how is his body at stake in the survey? And what does this uh, tell us? Um, so in my study of Grayson, I talk, um, uh, you know, I kind of show that there are many, uh, there is evidence, of course, of colonial ways of thinking. We find it in the volumes and in the unpublished files and correspondence. In some way, his identity is conventionally masculinist. But in other ways also, there's another narrative in this material, and that is one of illness and what Grierson frequently referred to as the breakdown of his eyes. Uh, so uh, in a series of letters in 1910, uh, Grierson wrote of how, uh, to quote him, my eyes broke down some months ago and for some months uh, was, I was not able to read or write. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I've given the reference to the uh, letter there. And then he also in the same letters uh, refers to how he had to go to Switzerland to consult a specialist. And these, this struggle with his eyes continued up to the mid 1920s. Uh, 
And in addition to his eye problems, he was dogged by ill health uh, from the early 1920s onwards. So for example, in June 1922, he suffered internal bleeding and a tumor. And in the mid 1920s, he was um, a dog, uh, he, he was confined to a wheelchair. And his letters of the 1920s uh, uh, reveal that he became an invalid on a number of occasions. Uh, uh, and uh, others actually had to write letters for him. Um, and in fact, Grayson's relocation to England in 1899 from where he um, conducted the survey was caused primarily by ill health. And he made it clear to the colonial government that unless he could relocate to England, the survey would uh, remain uh, unfinished. So there's a kind of sense in which the survey and Grayson's ill health were entangled from the beginning. And his ill health was exacerbated by the survey, but it also made the conduct of the survey possible because it motivated his move to England, which uh, uh, gave him the space and time and freedom to conduct the survey. Uh, while in Camberley, uh, Surrey. And there were both advantages and disadvantages to that. But my main point here is that his ill health is both uh, uh, a real disadvantage, but it's also a kind of enabling factor as well uh, in the survey. And in fact, you know, I would just suggest that we could perhaps read these episodes of partial sightedness in relation to what two of his correspondents called the superhuman focus that was required to finish the survey. So I've given the references two letters to Grace and refer to this superhuman focus. I mean, one way of thinking about this partial sightedness and the conduct of the survey is that basically to complete this massive project that was the survey, um, all other distractions had to be cut out. Only the survey with its massive volumes could occupy his visual and mental field. And so there's a kind of myopic partial sightedness, we might say, uh, which was necessary in order to, inc in order to complete uh, this massive uh, survey. So um, those are just some initial thoughts about the relationship between ill health, eyesight, and the linguistic work that uh, Grayson did. Uh, but uh, as you know, in the volume survey, we, um, I mean, I need hardly tell this audience, we have an immense deep density of detail and there's a kind of intensity of looking at India, a kind of intense uh, visual perspective on the subcontinent. But what I found also interesting was that uh, I also found in the letters and volumes indications of Grayson feeling he himself is being watched, he himself is being looked at, he himself is being surveyed. And it's almost as though while his eyes are on India, the eyes of others are on him. Uh, looking at India, he is looked at. And uh, just to give you, just to kind of explore this uh, train of uh, this train of thought. Um, for example, in March 1923, when Grayson was sent photographs of his uh, can I move this? Yeah, of his bust uh, unveiled at the Asiatic of Society of Bengal, he commented uh, in a letter. Uh, the eyes are not so vivacious as they would be in a photograph. So I think this comment is interesting because um, first Grayson does not focus on any other facial feature. He focuses on his eyes. And secondly, he doesn't compare the bust's eyes to his actual eyes, rather they're compared to how his eyes are represented in a photograph. It's almost as though his actual eyes are not a point of reference. They've become objects, and indeed he himself has become an object to be represented by others in a bust. So I'll uh, come back to that, uh, to that uh, question. Um, and then um, this sense of being seen while seeing India um, crops up in some passages in the volumes and the letters. Um, particularly when it comes to the gramophone recordings of Indian languages, to which I'll now, which I'll now uh, turn to. So Grayson gives many reasons for doing these recordings, but one was an expressed fear of how the British appear to Indians when they mispronounce Indian languages. I mean, put in another way, colonial pronouncements 
were let down by poor pronunciation. And this is quite uh, kind of explicit in the letters. And in my study of Grierson, so, uh, you, you know, I give uh, many citations to show this. So there's a sense in which the gramophone recordings are about um, strengthening the colonial order as an auditory order, as an aural uh, order. And in relation to this, there's a kind of revealing passage of this fear of being looked at and the estranging effects of the gaze of others, uh, something which I think uh, resonates with us today, but I'll come back to that when I talk about Fez and uh, Darian Leader. So when, he, when, for example, stressing the importance of cadence in speaking Indian languages, he describes in volume one, the case of an Indian of, of an English official speaking Bengali. And he says this, it's an almost, almost a kind of caricature of uh, an English official. Uh, on his arrival in India, he may possibly speak the language with perfect verbal correctness and with fair pronunciation. Yet, if he addresses the simplest sentence to a villager, he will find it a common experience to receive as a re reply, Saab, I do not understand English. <laughs> so without attempting to identify his separate words of his questioner, he couples this strange sentence melody with the white face and jumps to the conclusion that he is being addressed in English. So there's this kind of sense that this, these kind of slippages in pronunciation lead to the estranging effects of the powerful gaze of the Indian other. It's only by pronouncing correctly that you can be seen correctly. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's and that somehow you can have kind of control over the gaze uh, of, uh, 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 of the other. So, um, uh, so that's, uh, 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 let me now just kind of explore a little more some of the kind of paradoxically generative failings of Grierson's eyesight. So, and the question of embodiment in the gramophone recordings. So I've already kind of uh, looked at the gramophone recordings in terms of controlling the gaze of others through articulating by pronouncing correctly. And now I just want to look at how the human body appears and disappears in uh, the gramophone uh, recordings. So let me um, begin by just considering how in the correspondence I found kind of very basic questions raised about um, uh, human beings as embodied entities. So Grierson and his um, correspondence repeatedly described the gramophones as talking machines. And in fact, Thomas Edison in his essay, The Phonograph and Its Future of 1878, also dis described how the, it was as if the, gram the phonograph, when he was talking about the phonograph, he said it was just as if the machine itself were talking. And moreover, in Grayson's correspondence, there are a lot of references to the phonograph and the gramophone as, um, uh, sorry, beg your pardon. So, so this term, the talking machine, captured this, the combination of biological and mechanical functions attributed to the gramophone. But what's particularly interesting uh, here is, um, uh, it is, oh, sorry, I just need to, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what, but what's uh, particularly um, um, kind of important here um, is uh, some of Grayson's own correspondents measured themselves against the gramophone. So for example, in a letter of uh, July, 1916, Orlstein referred to himself as an imperfect gramophone when he was recording recit recitations. And in May, 1921, in a letter to Grayson, DC Fillet reported he was so mesmerized by the gramophone that he actually repeated the crack in the record he was listening to when reciting its language lessons. So it's not just that these correspondents were caught up in a mimetic loop with the gramophone as a machine. They were actually referring to themselves as biological machines in their active interaction with gramophones, in which as it were, the gramophone is setting the pace. So Grierson and his correspondents also referred to the gramophones when they were recording Indian languages. And the per one of the purposes was to teach the cadence pronunciation of languages to Indian civil service, British Indian civil service candidates. So they also referred to them as teaching machines. 
And there's a lot of um, material in the correspondence discussing how gramophones replace human teachers in language instructions, stressing the advantage of the gramophone as a machine over the embodied weaknesses um, uh, and, uh, and vulnerabilities of the human teacher. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, this, in the same essay that I referred to above by Edison, Edison actually says that the phonograph and gramophone articulate language better than humans do. Because to quote him, the original utterance was mutilated, that's his word, uh, by imperfect lips and mouths. And then to quote him again, these mutilations were eliminated or corrected by the mechanism of the phonograph. Furthermore, in the representative climate of the time, as Kidler has shown in his work, gramophone film typewriter, parts of the human body were imagined as reassembled and reproduced in the features of machines. For example, the ear membrane in the telephone and, and the mouth in the telegraph, and analogies were drawn between the human nervous system, the brain and the memory, and the phonograph and other machines of everyday technology, such as sewing machines and typewriters. And even the cor coronal sutures of the brain were likened to the grooves scratched on the wax cylinder uh, by the gramophone's point. Yeah, sorry, can you all hear me? Yes, yeah? yes, indeed we yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so, um, uh, so I just wanted to, uh, so yeah, so, so there was this kind of representative climate at the time when the human body was assembled and reassembled in relation to, uh, the, uh, to these uh, machines. But, um, and basically the survey was kind of participating in this representative climate in which machines were given human-like qualities when it came to the question of language uh, itself. So um, it's, not, it, it's not just that the human body was disaggregated in relation to the recording technology in this period, um, there's also in particular the sense that the phonograph, what's expressed I found in the correspondence is that the phonograph and the gramophone created this sense of one's ears being separate from oneself. Um, so this kind of sense of different organs of the body working apart from each other is captured in this letter from uh, DC Fillet to um, uh, Grayson where he's basically Philip uh, is discussing the use of the gramophone to, this, to teach Hindustani, but he's um, referring to his experience of, of learning Italian on uh, the gramophone. And um, he, this is what he says. He says, I found that it wasn't the ear that so much required training as the voice. My ear learned the in Italian accent in three repetitions of the first lesson. But when I started to repeat the lesson aloud with the phone, I found my voice and ear were not in accord. So we have this, this, these kind of unpredictable intersections between the survey and Grierson's body and the bodies of others. And in the, in the case of Grierson's own body, we get a kind of sense of its failings and its in, ill health as entangled in the making and the conduct of the survey. And in the case of others, we get these kind of glimpses of disintegrating, disaggregated bodies with the boundaries between the biological and the mechanical becoming blurred in the sphere of language and uh, recording uh, technology. So there are, but there are other ways I, in, in which I think the language work being done in the survey plays havoc really with what we might call the integrity of human embodiments. Now, one of the things I found um, quite interesting, um, others might not agree, is that Grayson and his correspondents repeatedly referred to the gramophone recordings as seances. But what was particularly interesting about this is that the term seance was used to refer not only to the playing of voice recordings whose speakers were not present, but also to recording sessions when the speakers were actually physically present. So in my studies, I kind of give citations for this. So I just wanna say a little bit more about this term seance, which after all refers to 
um, uh, it refers to kind of the appearance of disembodied presences. Uh, and uh, the first thing obviously uh, to note is that seances in Britain, particularly after the First World War, when the recordings were being managed by Grayson from Britain, uh, were very popular because of the um, you know, experience of mass bereavement after the First World War. But secondly, also uh, the, the culture of spiritualism and its seances were entangled with the new sound recording te technology because as the Scientific American wrote in December, 1877, the phonograph uh, created the possibility of the voices of the dead being reheard. And as historians have shown, the media scape of the late 19th and early 20th century centuries was often associated with the conjuring of ghosts and spiritual mediumship in seances was compared to the use of telephones, the wireless and the telegraph. Uh, uh, and in fact, um, uh, you know, you, the title of one leading spiritualist publication in the UK at the time was called the, one of them was called the Yorkshire Spiritual Telegraph. So, um, uh, and radio also was seen as a kind of medium of, uh, of uh, spirits um, with its discarnate voices fantasized as the transmission of voices from the beyond. So that I think the key point that I'm trying to make here is that what we see in this description of the gramophone recordings as seances is that occultism and technological media were merged in the late 19th and early 20th century and this 20th century and this kind of, of merging of the occult and technological recording media in the realm of language is articulated in this metaphor of gramophone recordings as seances. Um, uh, so this really, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, skipping ahead. Um, so this really uh, also leads to another question because the question in seances, I mean, if we think within the frame of the seance, I've never attended one myself, I have to have said, but anyway, if we think within the frame of the se seance, the, the question in the seance is who is talking actually? Is it the so-called spirit or is it the medium who's physically articulating using their, bi their, their, their biological features as a embodied presence, who's kind of physically articulating the voice of a disembodied presence? Uh, so in the case of the seance culture of the uh, uh, surveys recordings, who is the medium and who is the spirit? I mean, there are different ways of kind of thinking about this. I mean, in a way, because Grayson's own voice is not recorded, he hovers as a kind of discarnate spirit over the recordings, dictating the passages that are to be recording and as it were, that are to be recorded and as it were speaking through Indians who are reciting the passages he's prescribed to be recorded. Uh, so in one sense, you know, the kind of, recordings are kind of Indian reciters as mediums conveying Grayson's voice in the seances that are the uh, surveys recordings. So it's almost as though if you like these Indian mediums and in inverted commas are possessed by uh, Grayson's voice, but at the same time, Grayson is reliant on them to convey his voice. his voice. Without their voice, he himself has no voice. And so this kind of representation of the recordings of seances is an apt metaphor for the, I think, for the joint nature of the survey's authorship of knowledge in the field of Indian languages, which I discuss in a lot of detail in uh, my studies of Grayson. And I also discuss the kind of mutual reliance and endorsement between Indians and Grayson in the emergence of uh, regional languages and the creation of, as it were, personas for regional languages in the survey. So I look at this in quite a lot of detail, how, if you like, um, the survey is a kind of a joint project between Indians strategizing in the field of languages, appropriating Grayson and his names for their own purposes in order to win recognition for their languages, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in order to win institutional recognition uh, for their languages. So um, what can we uh, say here? What I, we, I think we can say is that in the uh, gramophone recordings, human beings in, in this kind of culture of the linguistic survey of India and the language work it's doing, human beings merge into 
machines on the one hand and become disembodied presences uh, on the other. Uh, as discrete embodied entities, they become difficult to hold on to. And the narrative of seances uh, almost engenders a kind of discourse about the dissolution of bodies, their porosity as discrete material entities. And also I think the multiple realms of signification and agency, which can't always be easily controlled. Um, and moreover, I think in a seance, what can be seen nonetheless exists. It can be heard and sensed in other ways. There are, as it were, in, within the framework of the seance, if we suspend disbelief for a bit, there are, as it were, other ways of seeing. And this leads me to uh, talk about the survey's double vision. Because on the one hand, the survey uh, sees like a state. Um, and Grayson's gaze on India is um, akin to the gaze of, a, of the colonial state. The survey produces numbers, it counts speakers, it makes maps, it names languages. And all these, as we know, are part and parcel of the state's gaze uh, in relation to society. But on the other hand, Gray Grayson repeatedly calls attention to the limitations of language maps. He frequently uses the word fictive. So he's kind of, there's this double vision here. He's pre the, the, the service volumes are full of these visual representations of India in terms of the mapping of languages. But in the text and in the correspondence, there's a frequent reference to these visual representations as fictive. Those are, that's his word, uh, not mine. And I discussed this in detail in chapter two of uh, my study, Nation and Region. And not only does he describe this, uh, these maps as fictive, he also evokes alternative visual devices to drawing boundaries between languages on maps. Uh, so for example, he says an ideal map of the Aryan languages of India would present to the eye, would present to the eye a number of colors shading off into each other. And in fact, shading is another key term that uh, crops up in the correspondence and in the volumes when he's thinking about visualizing uh, the language map of India. So embedded in this narrative of seeing like a state, we find another narrative which repeatedly questions the cartographic ideals of the colonial state. Similarly, and we've just heard from Professor Gita about the very important question of the politics of naming. And similarly, when it comes to the practices of naming, we know that naming is a key part of seeing like a state. The state you know, fixes languages as entities by naming them. But what we find in the survey is a kind of countervailing narrative in which the survey doesn't reify language names, but rather goes out of its way to call attention to their variety and range, and also dramatizes the difficulties of fixing languages through the processes of naming. So this is clear, for example, in the index of language names, which formed appendix three of volume one where the index cross identifies some 2,620 language names and dialects. And I looked at this index and I argue, and it's for you to dis decide whether I argue um, you know, plausibly or not. Uh, I, I mean, to me, it looks like the index is not um, stabilizing language names, rather it's actually proliferating them. And Grayson also foregrounds the complexities and difficulties of making decisions about language names. So one example is, for example, uh, is are his reflections on the name Bengali in volume five, part one of the survey. Uh, and another example is his reflections on the name Assamese, again in volume one, five, part one. And what we find, I think in the peppered throughout the volumes and, in, uh, and scattered in his correspondence, uh, is this kind of reinscription of Indian, local Indian nomenclature for dialects and languages, often pointing to uh, multiple names used by the speakers of languages themselves to refer to that dialect or language. So for example, at one point in, and I'll just give one example, in volume seven of the linguistic survey, he says, in, he, he, he says he's going to retain multiple names in deference to traditional usage. Um, and in actually staying, you know, basically what I think is happening is that uh, 
alongside the seeing like a state and naming like a state, he's also staying in dialogue with native names, Indian names for languages and dialects. And also I follow, I kind of show this in some detail, uh, perhaps boringly so, <laughs> uh, is um, he also relativizes English designations for Indian languages. And this again is the case with uh, his reflections on Bengali and uh, Assamese. So many of you will know that Peter Mulhausler in his great book has made some key points about the process of naming uh, languages in the Pacific region. And he argues that the identification of languages and their subsequent naming can constitute a very, uh, to quote him, serious trespass on the linguistic ecology of an area. And he adds that the very view that languages can be counted and named may be part of the disease which has affected the linguistic ecology of the Pacific. However, I mean, what I kind of pick up from the volumes and what I try and argue uh, in my book is that actually Grayson's power to name is very kind of unevenly exercised by him. It's rare, rarely a kind of a, an imposing power. Um, and I kind of see the survey less as a project to fix names like the colonial state wants to fix names or like any state wants to fix names, but rather it's more like an intervention in the field of names. Um, and as such, I think it's not, it can't completely be subsumed um, under the narrative of reifying languages and dialects in India through the fixing of names. So that's uh, what I want to, uh, you know, and I just want to say a little bit more about the the double vision uh, in the survey. I mean, because basically what I'm saying is that the survey sees like a state and simul simultaneously doesn't see like a state. Uh, and it, this I think also reflects the semi-detached relationship the survey had with the colonial state, which made very little provision for it. I discussed this again in detail in my study. And in fact, the term used to describe the survey in the official correspondence is demi-official. In other words, the survey was neither fully official nor completely non-official. So it was in this kind of gray area between the state and the uh, and something that was uh, uh, and something that was completely non-official. And a lot of district officials actually complained in the correspondence that you know they're having to provide information for this uh, survey, but no provision had been made in their workload for this. Um, and no allowance was being made, made for this. And Grayson actually had to kind of make many personal appeals. So, you know, he, he couldn't rely on an official relationship alone. He had to make lots of personal appeals to officials as well as many, many non-officials who contributed to the survey, which is another sign of the, of the survey is, is in this kind of gray zone between the state and the non-state. So he had to make these personal appeals to the, the two officials because uh, he really didn't have any standing as somebody who was uh, conducting the survey in retirement from England from 1899 onwards. So there's this kind of ambiguous relationship with the co colonial state, which is both a problem, but also in a, in gives Grayson an opportunity to see like the state, but also not see like the state because of this ambiguous semi-detached relationship with the state. And there's also the question of Grayson's uh, own subject position. I mean, in my book, I, books, I argue that we really need to think about Grayson as having a kind of cross, complicated cross-border selfhood. And we've had some very interesting discussions, um, again, Professor Giga's paper, but also papers yesterday on selfhood and language. And uh, I mean, Grayson, I think, does have a cross-border selfhood. He has what I call a triply hyphenated identity of Anglo-Irish Indian. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, he was a parti partial participant in all three terms, Anglo, Irish and Indian, because he himself was part of the Anglo Irish elite. He was not, but which meant that he was not straightforwardly Irish, nor was he straightforwardly English. And of course, despite his immense, his intense immersion in India and his many uh, intense friendships with Indians and his kind of partial identification with one version of India. He was also, of course, not uh, straightforwardly uh, Indian. So, and, and interestingly in the correspondence, I find in his correspondence with other Anglo-Irish uh, figures, there's a kind of sense of Anglo-Irish difference from other English 
if you like, fully paid up English members of the Indian civil service. And in some of these letters, there's a very uh, kind of expression of a fragile sense of whiteness. Um, and that, of course, has, um, has to be read in the context of um, you know, the, the fragility of the Irish, particularly in the 19th century, as white. Um, you know, the Irish had to become white. They weren't considered to be white at the beginning of the 19th century. And there'd been, there'd been a kind of lot of uh, studies of this. So, you know, there's this kind of fragile whiteness in the correspondence, which again also means that, you know, if you're thinking about this, and I mean, just to caricature as a kind of colonial white man, the word white has to be problematized here because of his Irish uh, connections. And also Grayson's um, letters have a very complicated sense of home. And it's worth noting that when he relocated to England in 1899, this was a relocation, not a return. And again, in his correspondence, his other Anglo-Irish colleagues who relocate to England express the difficulties of settling down in, in England, not just because they're kind of Anglo-Indian in the old sense of the term, so British officials who've been in India for a long time, but also because they're Anglo-Irish. So there's only this kind of partial identification with England and this kind of difficulty of making oneself home at home in England, because of course Ireland with the, the you know, Irish nationalism and the political violence in Ireland is somewhere where, with, where they can no longer feel at home in the way they did before. So all I'm trying to say is that there's also kind of very complicated politics of home in the survey, which comes out in all kinds of different ways. But that also means that, you know, Grayson's identification with the colonial state is a kind of partial identification. And it enables him to kind of, in the, his language work, to see and not see uh, like um, uh, a state. So I'm now, um, I think I've, uh, I've got another five minutes or so, another eight minutes, is that correct? Because we started a bit late. Uh, yes, Professor Majid, go ahead. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, um, so we have this kind of double vision and, um, uh, you know, he worked both with the state and outside the state. He spliced together a non-state narrative within a state-centered vision uh, of looking at India. And here it's just worth touching a little bit on the failed linguistic survey of Burma, uh, which I uh, discuss in some detail uh, in my books. Um, but um, uh, which was blocked by the colonial state. So, I mean, there are various reasons one could uh, think about that. But here, I just wanna note some issues and then I'll move to uh, uh, the leader and affairs that the issues that both the successful linguistic survey of India and the failed linguistic survey of Burma raise regarding the post-colonial legacy of colonial knowledge in relation to the state. Uh, and I guess the key uh, issue here is the conflict between the institutionalization of knowledge on multiple levels and the messiness of its production, which is something that we grapple with as academics, particularly as our relationship with the post-colonial state, and I include Britain here as a post-colonial state, has changed, and we may want to discuss that. And there's also the question of the relationship of the state to knowledge production and how this is to be defined, negotiated, and limited the question of who owns this knowledge uh, that is produced. And this question actually crops up in a very acute form and in an explicit form in, the, uh, in relation to the failed linguistic survey of Burma, where there's this kind of tussle between Taylor and uh, uh, Burmese state about who owns the data that he's produced. Um, uh, so and the, the, the language is this explicit language of property and ownership. Um, and then also there's the question of the interaction between knowledge production, the state and our own subject positions and the physical and embodied nature of the production of this knowledge, which is sometimes evident in surprising ways, ways which makes us vulnerable to all kinds of pressures. But in other ways, that vulnerability can also be enabling. And finally, I think, uh, you, know, it, you know, the survey also raises the question in how often you know, some of us reproduce a kind of double vision in our own work, because we have to attend to how the state sees and also including how it sees us, uh, while also kind of carving out other ways of seeing and looking. So um, those are just some, and now um, I, I won't keep you for much uh, uh, longer, but I just wanna kind of wrap up with some unfinished thoughts. I mean, the first thing I wanna talk about is 
the book Stealing the Mona Lisa, What Art Stops Us From Seeing. And now this book is really is, I, I mean, bear with me, there is a connection. This book is about the theft of the Mona Lisa in 1911 and how crowds flocked to the Louvre to gaze at the empty space where the Mona Lisa used to hang. So you have these kind of photographs of people gazing at this blank wall where the Mona Lisa hung before it was uh, uh, stolen. And I mean, in exploring the significance of this, what uh, uh, Leader says is that we are always caught up in uh, a, dynamic, uh, a dynamic of looks. Our look is linked dynamically to someone else's look. And from the start, we are looked at. And drawing on Lacan's uh, theory of vision, he argues that before looking, we are looked at, and at the dawn of our visual awareness, we feel we are looked at, um, which is a kind of state against which we feel we have no protection. And for that reason, the look of the other can often appear menacing. And then he goes on to say, this is the look that folklore has imagined as the evil eye. And Lacan thought there was always a dimension of evil rather than benevolence in that look. This is the dimension we find revealed in psychosis, where there's the conviction of being watched or spied on. Although this malevolent function of the look is clear in such extreme examples, Lacan believed it is present for all of us at a latent level. Our everyday reality is built up around its exclusion and when it emerges, the fabric of our reality uh, breaks down. So um, I don't wanna make too explicit the possible resonances of this passage in our kind of current predicament, but we may want to um, kind of think about it given the uh, recent news, uh, which is what happens when the latent becomes manifest? <laughs> what happens when we can no longer um, in our everyday reality exclude um, this malevolent look. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking about this in relation to kind of Grayson's own sense uh, when he's doing the survey that he's looking at India, but he is, while he's looking at India, being looked at. <laughs> so I'll just kind of leave it there and hopefully you can uh, kind of, uh, you know, draw your own conclusions. And my second concluding thought is about Fez's uh, prison poetry in which he experiments with ways of seeing while being looked at by the state while incarcerated and fixed therefore, physically fixed by the state's gaze and how he creates hope from despair in experimenting with different dynamics of looking. And uh, three poems in particular might speak to um, the current situation. Those are Zindan ki ek sub, Kede Tanhai and Zindan ki ek sham. And uh, in all of these poems, uh, in these three poems, what I find is um, how kind of uh, uh, Fares kind of creates this dynamic of looking which reverses the state's gaze through his careful observation of the play of light on his cell wall and the changing hues of the day and nightfall um, in his cell, through his cell window and in the prison yard. Um, and in, in Kede Tanhai, um, he, you have these kind of careful observations on the changing light in his prison cell, which give rise to an emotionally complex experience of the, what he calls the anxiety of hope. Um, and in his solitary confinement, you, you know, there's this kind of deprivation of sensory, uh, there's this kind of sensory deprivation, which leads to a loss of the sense of, um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, sorry, uh, a sense of concrete reality, but it also revives in him an alternative way of seeing, um, uh, which we, we, we could uh, talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of later. But, um, uh, you know, he also says, uh, uh, I mean, if I have time, uh, sorry, do I have three minutes? Um, is it okay? Yes. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Go, please yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, if I have time, so what he says, uh, you know, just to give an example from Kedet and Hai, Dur Afak Te Lerai Koi Nur Ki Leher, Ang Se Dur Kisi Sub Ki Tamihi Lie, Koi Nagma Koi Khushbu Koi Kafir Surat, Adam Abad Adam Abade Judai Me Musafir Surat, Be Khabar Guzri, Parishaniye Umid Lie, Parishaniye Umid, the anxiety of hope. 
Uh, sorry about my accent. You know, Grayson must be turning in his grave. <laughs> anyway. anyway, but one one thing it does, uh, just to kind of reflect on, uh, uh, you know, Fares reflects on the dynamics of looking in prison. He says imprisonment brings a new dimension, a new way in which you look at things. Objects one had not even noticed in normal life because we were too busy to perceive their ugliness or beauty appear anew. One's sensitivity is heightened. I feel that the kind of intellectual freedom you experience in jail, you don't experience outside. When you're outside, you're caught up in day-to-day -day affairs. You never see the entire canvas. So note the uh, re uh, reference to painting. Imprisonment opens uh, the windows of the home. So Lida suggests, and now I really will end, that for Lacan's visual, that for Lacan, visual art functions as a screen to divert the evil eye and to disarm it. Lacan's idea is that in some cases, visual art functions as a screen to divert the evil eye, to disarm it, just as some birds make terror molt, shedding feathers when confronted with a predator, humans drop things when threatened. You could think of the many folk tales in which someone is being chased and drops a magical object behind them to block the pursuer. The artist drops images or objects in order to survive. So Fez's poetry is certainly this, it's a survival technique, but it's also an attempt to distract the malevolent eye of the state. Sometimes though, the canvas that can also lead to seeing a fuller picture even while one is trying to distract that malevolent eye. And in this way, through the dy dynamism of a new way of looking, Fares was able to open up the possibility of the anxiety of hope from a place of darkness. And in this, I think, lies hope for all of us. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, uh, Professor Majid, for this uh, amazing you know, paper, which goes from Grierson to Lacan to uh, Fares. Um, it is, uh, I, I particularly among the many things that you spoke of, I, I, you know, I, I like the last bit where you brought up uh, this question of the gaze, uh, as well as the, 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 the uh, issue of naming of languages, which in a peculiar way, in a somewhat different way, is continues to be, uh, to, to be uh, an issue in uh, India. Not yeah. quite in the lang naming of languages so much as naming places um, in languages, right? Uh, you know, and especially it's a kind of reverse process where uh, many, you know, many in many regions there is this demand that the names of places that are specific to a particular language should be adopted by the entire, uh, you know, everybody else. This is, so I think it's, it's in some ways a part of that, that kind of uh, naming uh, process, uh, which has to do with, uh, with, with questions of language. Uh, but I think we have, what, 15 minutes uh, for uh, question answers. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think we, sh we should have at least, at least that much. Satya? Are you yes, saying? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, question in the chat box. Yeah. Shall I read them out? And... Yeah, perhaps it because people on the YouTube can't see the chat box. Okay, all right. So speaking of Grayson's feeling of not completely identifying with the state, um, this is uh, Vayam Sharma. Um, how is it in conflict with the fact that how well and detailed the uh, linguistic survey has been done? Yeah. So I would say that's a great question. I mean, I would say that um, the reason in part it's been done in so in such a detailed and uh, kind of, um, you know, incomparable way is precisely because it was not within the complete control of the state, because many of the uh, informants were not officials. Um, it was, as he called it, uh, to use his own term, a thousand men job. And many of these, um, these relationships of uh, what we might call multiple brokerages of knowledge, because you know, I kind of see Grayson as a kind of broker of knowledge rather than a kind of superintendent of the survey, were outside the purview of the state. And as I argue in my book, what Grayson tried to do, and this again is, is a down to the question of the politics of names, that what does the name Grayson signify for us 
I think the name Grayson signifies for us many things other than the individual person who is Grayson. And what I argue in my book is that Gray, you see this kind of cultivation uh, by Grayson of his name in order to kind of uh, be able to negotiate these relationships of knowledge book brokerage because of his locus standi as not um, a, a colonial official, but rather somebody who's in retirement. So um, that is basically the strategy of creating an aura around his own name, which is a kind of aura which we still kind of deal with. Uh, as I said, the name Grayson refers to a lot more than simply the individual person name, uh, individual person Grayson, um, is something that he used in order to generate data. So in order to get the information that he needed. And the other strategy was to, uh, you know, a lot of his correspondence include teachers, uh, missionaries, um, uh, you know, many others who are not um, uh, kind of connected to uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the colonial state. So there's a kind of, and also he had a very tense relationship with the census, um, so, which was obviously more fully funded and backed by the uh, colonial state. Um, so there's a lot in the correspondence where you know, the census, the, the, the uh, surveys categories are not fitting the census's categories and census officials are saying, well, what, you know, are getting kind of confused by the philological arguments about, um, uh, you know, in the survey, should we count um, Landa, as Grayson called it, or Saraiki, as we call it today, part of Punjabi or not, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, there's a kind of sense in which the survey is disorientating the kind of centerpiece of the state's way of seeing, which is the census. Um, and, the re and so, um, you know, I think I would say that's precisely, you know, the, the fact that the survey is so detailed and that the, it's the legacies of its knowledge continue to resonate today uh, for us. And it's something we still grapple with in all kinds of important ways. Is precisely because of this semi-identification with the state. It gave him a certain amount of flexibility um, and it meant that the survey couldn't be fully uh, appropriated by the state. And indeed, um, Aisha in, in her a very insightful review of my work and also in some of her other uh, essays has kind of made that point that actually we can attend to the colonial narratives in Grayson, but we can also look at these other narratives um, uh, uh, on linguistic plural, uh, uh, on linguist, on India as a linguistic region, and kind of redeploy these other non-state centric ways of lo uh, looking for our for kind of alternative uh, purposes, and that's only possible because um, from the beginning the survey was not fully appropriate, appropriable by the state. So that's I hope I've managed to answer that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the editing process uh, in the context of losing eyesight, especially as they were not typically, so this is from Tanmoy, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. So can you tell us a bit about the editing process of the survey in the context of losing eyesight, especially since these were not typically prose works and must have required acute attention to linguistic forms? How could he manage to do it so well? Yeah, I mean, I must admit that, uh, uh, I, I mean, I think the, the uh, question of editing and how he was able to do it, um, you know, it's uh, honestly a bit of a, a, a mystery to me. But what I would say is that um, one of the things mm, that one needs to think about here is that Grayson is a, the name Grayson is a kind of placeholder really for this extensive intercontinental correspondence with people in the US, uh, in North America, Europe, and India. It's, a, it's almost as though, you know, the correspondence is this kind of virtual debating um, club, this virtual kind of discussion group. And I think part of that has to do, and so part of the um, way we need to think about the survey is that it's not that Grayson was able to do it himself alone, but it's more that he was a kind of manager and knowledge broker. So we need to think about it as he himself called it as a thousand men job. And, um, and that's probably why he was able to, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of produce this work because we need to think about it as a collective collaborative effort, of course, shot through with hierarchies of power, 
but nonetheless um, uh, collective and collaborative in all kinds of ways in his interaction and with his interlocutors, both Indian, European, uh, and, and, and American. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's how I would answer that question, which is that in a way the name Grayson, even for some of his correspondence, comes to signify the possibility of joint authorship. And I uh, do discuss this in my study of Grayson, how people kind of approach him uh, with the assumption of joint authorship, because there's a kind of way in which his name is also now come, comes to signify this possibility of joint collective authorship. But of course, there's also a colonial dimension. As I mentioned, we can't simplify it, but that's how I would respond to that question. I hope that uh, answers it. And then uh, Aisha, yes, uh, in your book, so you speak of Gray, uh, Grayson's ascription to uh, Brahmanical Aryanism. Would it be fair to see this as another way of seeing or perhaps substitute for the fact that the linguist who can't see is not really the thing who should be seen in his own estimation or be seen in and as himself because of his profession, but won't see as the state does is an ideological alliance with those who make the objects of this study seeable for him less or more sinister. Wow, that's an amazing question. Can you just elaborate a little bit, Aisha? Do you mind unmuting yourself? Yeah, no, kind of... so, you, you know, I'm sorry, it, it just, uh, no. Asking questions in chat make you sound more dense than you intend to be. So you know, so so I've been reflecting as you've been talking on the uh, way that you know a linguist who's a field linguist. Um, well, of course, the object of the study is not you, right? So yeah. what you said, and so and the the linguistic example now the photograph a hundred years ago because the linguistic example never captures. So it's the linguist doesn't want to be seen, and in this case has is also not a seeing linguist because not only is his eyesight um, affected and at the same time he doesn't see as the state sees so how does he map you know map his intermediate position as neither the, the seer nor the thing that should be seen he knows he's because he records, as you um, um, point out, which I must say, I never know, noticed about the survey before, everybody who even edited the specimen yeah. is a collaborator mentioned in the linguistic survey of India. Yeah. So then how, you know, the, the cross-borderliness of Grierson that you talked about, how does Grierson position himself? So it's the pundits who are getting in the data. Yeah. Is it those people that, you know, so is the alliance that you mention and discuss um, very um, evocatively in the book, is the alliance also an instrumental alliance with the um, uh, with the pundits, or is it real? And because... yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't think the two are uh, uh, mutually exclusive, but I think that's a, a great uh, thought, and I would need to think about that a little more, because I. Uh, you know, you've actually opened up another possibility here, which is what I call the kind of mutual endorsement between Grayson and his interlocutors, including many pundits and Indian language activists, or even what we might call Indian language entrepreneurs. The word endorsement need to, we need to add the word instrumentalization to the word endorsement. And that actually, I think you're right, I may have I think the relationship needs to be nuanced even further, which is that, uh, you know, there is, there are genuine, there's a kind of politics of friendship and the very term politics of friendship brings in its compass, uh, not just mutual endorsement and kind of genuine uh, friendship. I mean, it's expressions of friendship being genuine, but also the possibility of instrumentalization and that uh, we need to kind of think about these relationships in even more complex ways. Uh, which is, um, you know, if I was to sum it up, both friendship in mutual endorsement, but uh, the word, you know, picking up on you, instrumentalization as well. And um, so, you know, it's like Grayson is becoming even more <laughs> complicated than I thought. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's, a, that's a, a, a great point. And maybe also the partial sightedness. I mean, I know this sounds sometimes one has to think counterintuitively, but maybe also the partial sightedness means 
in a peculiar way, your eyes see differently because you're partially sighted and your eyes can't be fully appropriated by the eyes of the state. I, I mean, that sounds a little bit kind of mm. trendy, but <laughs> you know, I mean, I think we're in a situation where we need to think counterintuitively in order, again, going back to some of the talk yesterday by Professor Menon on breaking rules, I think one of the way to break rules is to think counterintuitively. And I think, you know, the, and then the other way to maybe think about this is, you know, the gramophone recordings and Grayson's acute sensitivity to sound, could that also be linked to his struggles with his eyesight, which is that partial sightedness leads to increased sensitivity to sound and it leads to kind of other way it ne of necessity leads to other ways of, of seeing uh, in ways which are not cannot be commanded by the optics of the state i mean it's just a, a thought I mean, I, I, uh, professor yeah. Majid, there are two more questions in chat yeah. so if you could take those perhaps that'll be you know to be, take us to the yeah uh, sure so action. um for nepali uh, grayson's work is uh, based on turnbull yeah good uh the data for parables come from Kathmandu and grammatical explanations. Yeah, absolutely right. Are sought from uh, Captain Singh. Uh, however, he excludes. Uh, okay, yeah, now that's quite a technical. What are the two parameters of accepting Nepali from Nepal and denying Bujhal in Sikkim and how are they adopted? Uh, honestly, uh, I don't know. I'm really sorry. I would have to look at that in a little more detail. And I should say that, you know, I'm completely reliant on the files in the British Library. And, you know, one day, hopefully, people will be able to look at the files in the Indian National Archives, which are at the moment cannot be consulted. And maybe the answers to that will come there. But you raise an important question, uh, because one of the things I do discuss is the multiple modes of knowledge gathering in the survey because Grayson in his sketches on uh, dialects and languages relies not just on the ground level generation of data, but also as you've rightly shown here on pre-existing uh, published sources. So there's this kind of splicing together of a pre-existing published archive on the languages concerned with the ground level generation of data. Uh, and so there's a kind of composite mode of uh, knowledge production. So um, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. So what, what do you think? So there's another very good question. What do you think is the impact of Grayson's work on the relationship between the post-colonial state and speaker-centric efforts to record, document, promote languages due to increased availability of sharing technologies in recent times? Yeah, so I think this is a, uh, a really important question. I mean, I'm I maybe, speaking out of turn here, but that's partly why I wanted to raise this question of our relationship with the state as academics, because it seems to me mm, that the post-colonial state uh, in many ways, not entirely, mm, is a kind of colonial state. And um, many of the things that Grayson was grappling with on a much higher scale we've all been grappling with in relation to the state and the question of the production of knowledge, particularly since the 1990s. And I do think when we're thinking about these questions, we need to think geopolitically. I mean, I do think the fall of the USSR in the 1990s, at least in Britain, changed our relationship with the state as academics. Because while the USSR was around, we needed to perform freedom. Once the USSR was no longer around, we no, were no longer needed to perform freedom. And the state showed itself in its true colors when it came to the institutions of higher education. So what I'm just trying to say here is that we need to period, periodize the question of the relationship between the post-colonial state. And particularly, we need to think about that changing relationship since the 1990s with the, not just the fall of the USSR, but the uh, growth of neoliberalism which has affected, uh, to which, for which technology is of crucial importance. Um, and also which has a kind of affected, many people have argued our con very conceptualization of language and the kind of language uh, work uh, we do. Uh, and when it comes to the actual uh, technology, yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not an internet native, but I mean, it seems to me mm, that one of the things about technology, 
uh, today is that increasingly so many of our battles are also fought in the in the online world and that there's kind of online activism and offline activism and there's online surveillance and offline surveillance and we kind of are juggling uh, you know these two things in, in very difficult ways and also when it comes to the question of the gaze one of the things uh, you know we might want to think about here is you know, Zoom and being watched on Zoom. When we look into the computer, we see ourselves as though in a mirror, but we also see in that mirror, the gaze of others looking at us. We see the images of others also looking at us. And, you know, there are all kinds of other issues about, uh, you know, what is looking at us exactly. So, I mean, I'm not really answered your question, you know, I'm not very good at answering questions always, but I mean, I think it opens up a whole new area about the question of the intersection of the offline and online worlds, the question of the gaze, the, uh, the gaze on Zoom versus the gaze on in the offline world, uh, and the question of surveillance and knowledge production, um, particularly as so much language activism is also done in the online world. Uh, and I, you know, probably people are researching this. How how does the how how does online activism relate to offline activism at the ground uh, at the ground uh, level? Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think we are uh, out of time totally. Uh, yeah. there, is, there is another question in the chat uh, from YouTube. Uh, should um, but it's uh, seven twenty six. So. Uh, Perhaps we can conclude the session and. and uh, it was the, answered actually, so we could stop okay. because um, um, we have to we have to stop recording and then restart so that. Okay. So uh, the the very yeah. good question. Can I go ahead or should I? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Please. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. So your presentation outlined an instance of how the history of technology produced a reorganization of the body and not just time and space. This suggests a complex, often discordant relationship between knowledge and the techniques and technologies mobilized for its production. But your pres presentation suggested an equivalence of everyone subjected to those techniques and technology. Absolutely right. The surveyor and the surveyed seen through the lens of colonial epistemology. Have you negotiate, negotiated the other epistemolo epistemologies at work in this dynamic, some in collusion and some against? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, um, I would need to, uh, yeah, if, if there's ever a second edition <laughs> of my Grierson books, I will definitely have to take up that. I'm sorry, I can't answer it now, but what are the other epistemologies? And of course, um, James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State is very much about those other kind of everyday epistemologies, um, which the seeing like a state renders invisible. And you know that would be a really interesting way of revising my argument, which is, uh, you know, are there any signs of other possible epistemologies in the survey, which are fragment? Are there fragments of it? And if they are, are they rendered visible? And how are they rendered visible? And if not, um, is it because they're made invisible, or or, or why? So sorry. I'm answering your question with a question like a politician, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I would really need to think about that. That's a great question. It opens up a whole um, area of further inquiry. So thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Professor Majid for this uh, session and uh, for pa participating in this uh, expression of solidarity with Dr. Hani Babu. And uh, the session is now uh, over, and I hand it over to uh, Aisha or Eva, whoever is going to take the next. Me, but we'll stop recording for, and we'll just take a break for a minute so that we.